Well, good morning, church family. Please turn with me in your copy of God's Word to the book of Isaiah. The book of Isaiah, chapter 9. It's page 680 if you're using your pew Bible. So this morning, we're pausing our study, our ongoing study through Matthew's Gospel. This is the Advent season. And so for the next three weeks, we're going to be here in the Old Testament book of the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah is one of the longest books in the Bible. It's a book of prophecy of Isaiah telling the people, thus saith the Lord. It's written mostly in uh, poetry, in a poetic form. Uh, It was written in a time period of ancient Israel, ancient Judah, that uh, we're probably not very familiar with, the the, the cultural and the political situation uh, that informs how uh, what this book was written. But that, that, that it, well, excuse me, what was going on at the time is actually very important to understanding the message of Isaiah. And really, that's true of all the Old Testament, especially the, the prophets. And so for all those reasons, our, our distance and our difference in culture and language and style, all those reasons and more, um, Isaiah and most of the other Old Testament prophets are often uh, kind of ignored in our day and age, right? Just be honest, it's okay. <laughs> we tend to skim over them, or we tend to ignore them altogether, or uh, with Isaiah, we can kind of glean through them and pick out some of those really familiar and specific prophecies that we know are explicitly about Jesus, and especially at this time of year. But of course, we have to remember that all of the Bible is breathed out by God, and all of the Bible is profitable for teaching, reproof, instruction, correction, It takes a whole Bible to make a whole Christian, as other men have said. And so we ignore the Old Testament prophets to our own detriment, our own lack of Christian formation. Did you know that the book of Isaiah is the second most quoted book of the Old Testament in the New Testament? Anybody know what the first one is, by the way? Anyone? I heard someone say Psalms. Yes, Psalms is the most quoted book in the New Testament, but Isaiah is right behind it. And did you know that the book of Revelation, the last book in our scriptural canon, of course, the book of Revelation draws upon basically the entire Old Testament for its apocalyptic and prophetic imagery, but the book of Revelation references the book of Isaiah more than any other book that it references. And did you also know that for centuries in church history, going all the way back to the early church fathers in the second century, Isaiah has often been referred to as the fifth gospel. The fifth gospel. We need the Old Testament, beloved. We need the prophets. And so what we're going to do for the next three weeks is we're going to look at three specific and probably familiar prophecies from the book of Isaiah that are fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Now, right off the bat, you might be saying, okay, pastor, I get it. We've, we hear these same prophecies trotted out every year at, at Christmas time. I know they're talking about Jesus. We get it. You don't have to overly explain it. Well, yes and amen. Again, these prophecies are probably familiar to us as Christians, but I'm sure you understand that sometimes some things can become so familiar to us, not just God's Word, but things in life in general can become so familiar to us that we lose the the wonder. We lose the glory. We lose the dazzling richness of God's Word for the familiarity. And so my goal for these next three weeks is to help us Uh, dig into these familiar passages to help us understand a bit more about how biblical prophecy works, how uh, the original hearers and the original readers would have understood some of these things, and of course how these words are ultimately fulfilled in Jesus Christ. And hopefully this will give us all a fresh uh, awareness and a fresh understanding of the glorious reality that Jesus, coming to earth as a little baby, was always... God's plan. wasn't an afterthought. It wasn't an accident. It was always plan A. It was sovereignly intended. It was sovereignly decreed. It was sovereignly ordained, and it was sovereignly carried out. And all of that was for God's glorious and sovereign purpose of saving his people. So before we, before we dive into the passage, before we actually read the text this morning, I want to take just a minute to sort of set the stage if you will, set the stage for these prophetic words of hope from the prophet, from God, given for the hope uh, of God's people. So broadly speaking, the book of Isaiah describes three people, three characters, 
uh, who will save God's people. In chapters 1 through 39, Isaiah describes the king. In chapters 40 through 55, he describes the servant. And then in chapters 56 through 66, he describes the conqueror. The king, the servant, and the conqueror. And of course, what we know, thanks to the ongoing revelation and the ministry of the Holy Spirit, we know that these are not actually three individual people, right? These are not three distinct characters, but rather three characteristics of one person, the Messiah, the promised one, the one who will fulfill all of these prophecies and accomplish the saving of God's people. And so we're going to save the descriptions of the, the, the servant. We're going to save that for the Lenten season. Next week, we're going to look at the conqueror. And so this morning, although, of course, we're only going to be able to just scratch the surface, we're going to look at how the Messiah, the one who will save his people, is to be the king. The king. The king was a big deal for the nation of Israel, right? Remember, God brought the people out of slavery in Egypt Uh, They wandered in the wilderness for 40 years because of their refusal to trust God. Then he finally brought them into the promised land under Joshua. Then Joshua died, and there was a period of about 400 years or so when there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes, but periodically they would repent of their sin, cry out to God, and God would raise up a judge. And there was this whole cycle of, 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 of sin and, and, re- and wickedness and rebellion and repentance and restoration, and that kept going on and on. And after 400 years, the people were sick and tired of this cycle, and so they cried out to God, give us a king. Why did they want a king? Well, if you read the text, the reason they gave was, first of all, because they wanted to be like the other nations around them. That's why they wanted a king. But on a deeper level, what they wanted is, was, uh, on a certain level, was, was, was th- were th- uh, things that were good. They were tired of this cycle of, of wickedness and then salvation, and wickedness and salvation. So I propose to you that the desire for a king on a deeper level, the desire for a king is the desire for four things I'm going to talk about this morning. The desire for a king is the desire for identity, stability, prosperity, and posterity. Identity, stability, prosperity, and posterity. So let me talk about these really quickly. Identity. Who are we as a people? Who are we as a nation? What are our common values, our common beliefs that give shape to our our culture and our way of life? What gives us our common unity or community? What are these things that we all share that define how we relate to one another as a people? The identity of the king gives shape to the identity of the nation. Stability. Under the judges, Israel had gone back and forth from worshiping God in peace and in safety and then rebellion and rampant idolatry and wickedness and then to violence as they descended into uh, chaos and then back to the right worship of God as God raised up the judges. And this, again, this cycle continued for 400 years. But the formalized institution of the monarchy, the kingship, gave stability to the nation, right? It put an end to that. It had a, the general suc- a, a, a formalized succession of kings who would theoretically put a stop to those cycles. Prosperity. That hierarchy and the, the, the stability and the prestige that the kingship and the king himself brought would ultimately provide for the prosperity of everyone under his rule, provided that he was a good and godly king, of course. So no more would the people simply exist and survive as these little tiny uh, uh, unrelated communities dotting the countryside. Under a king, they would be organized and formalized into a national body. They would be able to provide and work together for, to, de- to uh, provide for the common defense, to defend their nation from enemies. They'd be able to live and work and build their families and build their communities and build their wealth in peace, in shalom, complete freedom, safety, well-being. Together they would be structured and organized to work for the good and the prosperity of all. And then fourth, posterity, because everyone wants the assurance that those first three things, their identity, their stability, and their prosperity will not just be for themselves, but will continue on to their children, their grandchildren, 
and so on and so forth. When Moses died, he already had a successor in place, Joshua. When Joshua died, there was no such strong successor, successor appointed. And for the cycle of judges, every time a judge died, the nation within a generation or so very quickly returned to idolatry and wickedness and violence and chaos. But under a king and a kingship, a king whose descendants would continue providing that identity and stability and prosperity, they could continue providing those same things to your posterity for generations and generations to come. So this is what the people ultimately wanted. They wanted a king to give them identity, stability, prosperity, and posterity. And God answered their request, didn't he? He gave them Saul. Hmm, Saul wasn't quite the king the people wanted, though. And in a way, by raising up Saul, God was telling the people, this whole king thing is really not going to go the way you think it's going to go. But then, of course, Saul was followed by David. David was consider, is still considered the greatest king in Israel's history. He's their national hero to this day. The Bible calls him a man after God's own heart, despite all his uh, huge sins and moral failings. He was the beginning of the line of kings of Israel and of Judah. He was the one with whom God made his covenant, 2 Samuel chapter 7. The covenant and the promise that someone from David's line would rule not over just Israel, not over just Judah, but over all the nations of the earth forever. That's a big promise. And so then when David died under his son Solomon, the kingdom grew and expanded in their wealth and in their peace, their prosperity and their posterity. And so the people thought that Solomon was the answer. Solomon might be the fulfillment of God's covenantal promises. But of course, Solomon strayed from God near the end of his life. And then under Solomon's son Rehoboam, the kingdom was split into two. Ten tribes of Israel in the north and the two tribes of Judah in the south. The northern kingdom very quickly devolved, almost like the cycle of judges. Idol worship, wickedness, violence, chaos. The kingship itself left the house of David and it passed from a different house to different house because there were coups and assassinations and revolts until finally the kingdom of Israel in the north was invaded, destroyed, carried off into exile by the mighty Assyrian Empire in the year 722 B.C. Now, the southern kingdom of Judah was not without its problems and its sin and its political intrigue, but they had more good and godly kings than the northern kingdom of Israel did overall. And by the time of Isaiah, there was still a descendant of David's line on the throne. By Isaiah's time, uh, King Uzziah, had been a, an upright and a godly ruler for over 50 years, longer than David and Solomon themselves. Uzziah had brought the true worship of the true God back to its rightful place at the center of Judah's national life, their identity. He brought peace and he brought political stability to Judah's uneasy relationship with the Assyrians to the north, with the Philistines to the, to the west, with the Egyptians to the south. There was relative peace and stability and prosperity. Under, uh, under King Uzziah, it was a good time to live in the kingdom of Judah. But then, of course, tragedy struck. King Uzziah, like all his predecessors, died. He stumbled at the end of his life, like so many of his fathers. And when he died, the stability of the nation once again began to deteriorate. Petty squabbles broke out. Amongst them, enemy nations sought to seize the uh, opportunity to attack them. David's descendants couldn't seem to really get it right, could they? Couldn't seem to fulfill God's promises that way. There was certainly no king from the line of David by that point who fit those descriptions of God's covenantal promises of the perfect king of all the nations. By the time Uzziah's grandson Ahaz took the throne... Judah's hopes for peace and stability were placed not on God or on God's promises, but on mere earthly political alliances, especially with Egypt. Isaiah warned him not to do this, but Isaiah refused, or excuse me, Ahaz refused to heed the warnings from Isaiah, from God. King refused to trust God, and so Judah's destruction seemed imminent. They were soon to suffer the same fate as their northern brothers. And so then Isaiah's book written over the period of 25 years. The first five chapters of Isaiah's book 
He spends these chapters exposing Judah's sin, exposing their wickedness, their rejection of God, and pronouncing woes, pronouncing God's impending judgment upon his people as a result of their sin. The nation was in shambles. The kingship was in shambles. The northern kingdom had already been destroyed, and so what were God's people supposed to do? Where were God's promises? Where was God? And so into the midst of this darkness, this despair because of Judah's wickedness and uh, God's impending judgment on their sin, in the midst of this hopelessness and the seeming futility of the line of David, Isaiah chapter 6, he records that glorious vision. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon the throne, high and lifted up. God was still there. God was on the throne of the universe. God had not forgotten His covenant. And so then Isaiah was given this prophetic task of proclaiming God's word to God's people, although God said, they're not going to listen to you. And so into that time of the darkness of wickedness, the, the despair of this impending judgment, the hopelessness of God having apparently forgotten His covenant, the prophet then speaks this word from the Lord. We begin reading in Isaiah chapter 8 and verse 21. The people will pass through the land greatly distressed and hungry. And when they are hungry, they will be enraged and will speak contemptuously against their king and their God and turn their faces upward. And they will look to the earth, but behold, distress and darkness, the gloom of anguish, and they will be thrust into thick darkness. But there will be no gloom for her who was in anguish. In the former time, he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, but in the latter time he has made glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in the land of deep darkness, on them has light shone. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as they are glad when they divide the spoil. For the yoke of his burden and the staff for his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. For every boot of the trampling warrior in battle tumult and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace there will be no end on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Father, open our eyes that we may behold wondrous things in your word. Make us wise, make us faithful. Make us to see the glory of your plan, your covenant, your promised King, your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. So I hope by taking the time to set the stage, you get a better idea of the significance and the power and the hope that is contained for God's people in these words. This morning, we're just going to focus on those last two verses we just read, those familiar verses, verses 6 and 7 of chapter 9, because those are the ones we hear every year at Christmas time. This week, as I switched my attention from Matthew to Isaiah, I was powerfully reminded of the glory and the beauty of God's Word. I haven't spent much time in the Old Testament lately because I've been focusing on Matthew for some time now, but coming back to it and seeing with fresh eyes just how biblical prophecy works, how the human author conveys the words of the divine author, how, the, how biblical prophecy weaves together other parts of Scripture, how it moves back and forth between talking in the, pres the, the, the present tense and the past tense even about future things because they're so certain because God has said it, they are as certain as if they had already happened how they use this, uh, what we call a telescoping, uh, shifting focus of, of near-term things and far-term things, 
how the, a near-term fulfillment of a prophecy is often a fulfillment and also a prediction and a, a further portent of something greater that's yet to come. And how all, all of Scripture, from Genesis to Revelation, so clearly and obviously comes from the mind of God Himself, and it points us to Christ. It points us to Christ. He is the one who fulfills all things. Beloved, you can never exhaust God's Word. So get yourself a good study Bible and read it. <laughs> Even a book that can be intimidating like Isaiah. Read it. So we're not going to be able to exhaustively mine these words this morning. And praise God for that, really. We're going to look at just a bird's eye view of what's happening here. So first, how would Isaiah's original hearers and readers have understood this passage? Uh, in the, in uh, medieval times, Jewish scholars often claimed, and still do to this day in many cases, they claimed that this was referring to the imminent birth of King Ahaz's son, the crown prince, Hezekiah, who you recognize that name. And that Hezekiah's birth, he, well, he was the sign to the people that God was still with them. That there was still a descendant coming from David's line. And in, in, a, in a similar way, that happened back in Isaiah chapter 7, uh, when he said, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son. And then shortly after that, Isaiah's own son was born. We'll talk more about that in a couple of weeks. But the people thought that King Ahaz's son, Hezekiah, th- he would be the one to finally fulfill God's promises. It wasn't David or Solomon or Uzziah or Ahaz, but Hezekiah would be the one. He will be the one to multiply the nation and increase its joy. He will be the one to get rid of the oppressor and put an end to war. He will be the one to judge between the nations. And under his reign, like Isaiah said back in chapter 2, the people will finally be able to beat their swords into plowshares. But of course, as we know, this was not the case. Some, commentator, some Christian commentators, not Jewish commentators, they pointed out that in this passage, in these familiar words, Isaiah never explicitly says, this child will be the king. Now this may have been sort of an implicit rebuke to the kings of Israel and Judah because they had failed so often. And so if those men are going to be called kings, then to call this righteous and glorious Messiah person by that same title seems almost an insult, sort of damning him with faint praise, as it were. But who is the true king? The one who has the title or the one who has the power? So none of those previous kings could provide God's people with what they deeply wanted, what they really needed. Identity, stability, prosperity, and posterity. Couldn't do it. But Isaiah says here that there is someone coming who can and will provide all these things. The true and perfect king will come. God has not forgotten. There is one who will come who will bring light to the people who walked in darkness. And it will begin with the land of Zebulun and Naphtali. These were the two northernmost tribes in Israel. They were the first ones to be invaded, destroyed, and carried off into exile. They comprised the region known as Galilee. And 700 years later, Galilee would be home to a city called Capernaum, where a carpenter from Nazareth began proclaiming that the kingdom of heaven had come. Spoiler alert right now, I'm going to tell you, the, uh, the fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy is Jesus. It should come as a shock to none of you. So how does this messianic king in Isaiah give identity, stability, prosperity, and posterity to his people? First, his identity. Any organization, any organization tends to take on something of the personality or the identity of its leader, right? That's just the way things work. That's basic reality. Uh, God baked uh, that kind of structure and that kind of reality into creation, That's why it's so crucial for husbands and fathers, leaders in every sphere, every level of human society, to be conformed to Christ. Families take on the identity of the father. Churches take on the identity of the pastor and elders, which is why that's such a huge calling and one that I strive to take very, very seriously. And yes, nations tend to take on the identity of the king. And so a good and upright king or even in our case today, a good and upright president, Congress, Supreme Court, whatever. A good and upright leader will tend to produce a good and upright people. 
That's the role of the law, by the way. And in this, by the same token, a wicked king or leader will tend to produce a wicked people. This was certainly true in Israel and Judah. Just go through and read the books of Kings and Chronicles. So in order for the Messianic king to give his identity to his people, we first have to know what is his identity. And so what does Isaiah tell us? Verse 6, For to us a child is born. He's a child, okay? Jesus was and is fully human, right? Born of a woman, born under the law, Galatians 4.4. 4. To us a son is given. Jesus was not only fully human, he was given in that sense by God. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. The eternal Son of God, the second person of the triune Godhead, became incarnate and was given at the first Christmas. He's fully and truly human, yet he's also fully and truly divine. The government shall be upon his shoulder. Not just the mere title of a king, a title that was emptied of its meaning and its import by wicked men who were pretenders to the throne, but the full and true administration of righteous and justice would be His, just as God intended. And His name, His name, the name is a powerful thing in the Bible. If you know someone's name, you know their identity. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor. He would rule in perfect righteous wisdom. All of His counsel in the sense of advising a king. His counsel is perfect and righteous. He would be the one to dispense supernatural and perfectly righteous divine counsel in all things, for he himself is perfectly divine and righteous in all things. His name shall be called Mighty God. He's the hero, the Mighty One, the Holy One of Israel, as Isaiah says so often. He's the one who overcomes evil. He's the one who cannot be defeated even by all the evil the world can muster, all the evil that the, 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 the devil himself can throw at him, cannot defeat him. He is the mighty one because he is nothing less than God incarnate. Mighty God. He's the everlasting Father. Now we today as Christians, we recognize Father as a term for God. The Old Testament Jews would never have dared to call God Father. Perhaps God was the father of the nation of Israel in an aloof, paternalistic sense, but not in the sense that we have in Jesus. And that was one of the reasons, by the way, the Pharisees accused Jesus of blasphemy because he dared to call God Father, Abba. In the ancient Near Eastern world, many kings were called a father to their people, in a sense, but that really wasn't the case in Israel. So how could any, any mere, mere earthly king have the audacity to claim such a lofty title, Everlasting Father? The only way he could be called this, beloved, is if it's actually the case. If it's actually true. He is God incarnate. He is everlasting. He's of the same essence as the Father. He is the perfect king and ruler of all things from everlasting to everlasting. He's the Prince of Peace. And for this description, I'm going to quote a certain commentator, Alex Mutter. He describes this title this way. He says, on a personal level, peace, shalom, means fulfillment. To die in peace means to have lived a fulfilled life, to have achieved all that God planned. Peace is well-being. It's freedom from anxiety. In relationships, it's goodwill and harmony, the opposite of war. And towards God, it is the full realization of His favor, peace with God. And so the Prince of Peace Himself is the whole man, perfectly integrated, a perfectly rounded personality, perfectly at one with both God and humankind, but also as a prince, He administers those same benefits to His people. He's the Prince of Peace, and He will reign from the throne of David and over His kingdom. God has not forgotten His covenant with David. The Messianic King will be from David's line. He will rule in accordance with God's character, with God's call, with God's covenant. This is the Messianic King's identity. What about stability? He goes on to say, verse 7, Of the increase of His government, there will be no end. 
He will establish it and uphold it with justice and with righteousness. Under Solomon, that, that, that increase and that stability that they saw will be fully and finally and eternally realized. All who live under his rule will be governed with justice and righteousness instead of with duplicity and wickedness, power struggles, petty vendettas. He is the prince of peace, and so under his administration, violence and destruction and chaos will be a thing of the past. He will bring stability, prosperity. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. Peace, shalom. Again, it's more than just the absence of war. It's everything we just mentioned a moment ago. Well-being, wholeness, the absence of need or of want or of anxiety, perfect relationships with God and with others. Later on, the prophet Micah, he echoed the words of, of Isaiah. Micah said, "...the nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more, but they shall sit every man under his vine, under his own fig tree." No one shall make them afraid, for the mouth of the Lord of hosts has spoken. Freedom from war, freedom from want, freedom to simply live and work and provide for yourself and your family, perfect relationships with others and other nations, ultimately a perfect relationship with God. The Messianic King brings posterity, or excuse me, prosperity. And that does bring us to posterity. Under the Messianic King's administration, peace, true shalom, will not only exist, but it will increase. It will continue to increase. How long? Without end. There will be no end. He will rule with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. There's no more worrying about what happens when a good king dies. No more anxiety about what your children will do under a coup or a revolution or an assassination or even just a simple change in administration. There's no more fear that your children and grandchildren might be enslaved and oppressed by tyranny or taxation or that they will somehow have to rebuild the world that has been decimated by anarchy and chaos and wickedness that is caused by being ruled by weak and wicked and worthless men. So how could one man do all these things? How could a King Ahaz's son Hezekiah do these things? He wasn't the fulfillment of this prophecy. But there was one coming who would. But even as true as that is, beloved, we must not lose sight of this. <laughs> Like I said, in biblical prophecy, so often something that happens that fulfills the prophecy itself is still both a fulfillment of the prophecy and a sign that the prophecy has yet to be ultimately fulfilled. And the birth of Jesus is one of those things. The birth of Jesus 2,000 years ago, it was the fulfillment of this prophecy, and yet it wasn't the completion of this prophecy. Do you see the distinction? Jesus coming to earth as a little baby in Bethlehem was only the beginning of the fulfillment of this prophecy. By God's grace, through His revelation, we know today, we can know and recognize what those saints of old only saw as a shadow. That Jesus came the first time to deal with sin, as the writer of Hebrews says. He came to be offered up as a sacrifice to bear the sins of many but we are still waiting for his second coming, right? His second advent. When he comes a second time, he will come not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. He has already come. He has not yet come again. When he came the first time, the angels proclaimed, peace on earth, goodwill to men. But then Jesus said later on that he came the first time not to bring peace but a sword. Because as the angel said, his peace is for his people. Those upon whom God's favor rests. And in between his first and second coming, God's favor resting upon us results in enmity with the world. Jesus came not to bring peace but a sword. 
But when Jesus comes the second time, He will come with a sword to conquer His enemies once and for all and so finally bring peace to His people from this time forth and forevermore. His kingdom is already inaugurated, but His kingdom is not yet consummated. Where we live right now, beloved, where we live right now, we live in the from this time forth, but we're still looking for the and forevermore. David's son, Isaiah's son, Ahaz's son, all these pointed forward to David's greater son. Son of God, Son of Man, the Son of God incarnate, Jesus of Nazareth, the Messiah, who came first to Galilee and brought light to all the nations. But His first coming, His first advent is still pointing forward to His second coming. His second advent, when He will finish what He has begun. When He will finally fulfill every aspect of the prophecy. God's covenantal promises will be fully and finally realized in all their complete and unending glory. As we live in between His two advents, the good news of the Gospel is that we can have those deep desires that we all have. We can have the identity and the stability, the prosperity, the posterity that only the true King of Kings can give. Because of the perfect life and the sacrificial death and the victorious resurrection and the glorious ascension of our Lord Jesus Christ, all who come to Him in repentance and faith are given His identity. We're adopted into His family. We're given His name as ours. Christ, our elder brother. We're given His Spirit within us. We're made into new creations to walk in newness of life. We're given His stability as He makes us citizens of His heavenly kingdom, which is not from this world, which is built upon an unshakable foundation and against which even the very gates of hell will not prevail. We're given His prosperity, not earthly riches, but the infinite riches of God given to us in Christ. As we live and we labor for His kingdom on this earth, we lay up for ourselves treasures in heaven and we look forward to His second coming. And in Christ, we are assured of His posterity. As we await that coming day when under the perfect administration of the perfect Prince of Peace, nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. We shall all beat our swords into plowshares because His peace will be ours forever, for all posterity. So as we live in this glorious salvation that He secured for us in His first advent, we await the second advent of the King of Kings, the rider on the white horse, the only one who is faithful and true, the one who holds the keys to death and to Hades, the one who will slaughter His enemies once and for all and usher in peace for His people forever the true ruler of all the universe, the one who rules even now in heaven above, the one who will come again to rule in the new heavens and the new earth, the new Jerusalem that is not made by human hands, on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. And how will all this happen? The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. And so we cry out, Maranatha, even so come, Lord Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we praise you. We thank you that you did not forget your covenant with your people, with your servant David, but you sent your son Jesus to fulfill all of your promises. He is our perfect prophet. He is our great high priest. He is our king. He is the king of kings and lord of lords. And so we, your people, your people from every nation whom you have called out of darkness and into the marvelous light of Christ, Jesus of Galilee of the nations, we praise you for the salvation that you have given us in him, which you have made available to all who come to him in repentance and faith. So give us your strength. Give us your courage that we may go and proclaim to all the world that Jesus Christ is king, that salvation is found in no other name, and that the king is coming again. 
It is in Jesus' name and for the sake of his glorious kingdom that we pray these things. Amen.